Let's do it. Pedro, how you doing? Good, doing great. What about you? I'm doing great. Um, looking forward to the discussion today and in preparation for this. You know, you, you booked yourself in on the Calendly link and in preparation, I acquainted myself with some of your work and um, well, one, it seems like you're up to a lot and and we'll dig into some of it. But two, man, the um, anatomy of Bitcoin film looks incredible. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I definitely want to start with that, but perhaps first you can just, you know, give any kind of intro you want to give and then we'll get rolling. Yeah. Um, I've been working on that project and I, now I'm trying to, um, kind of promote it and make it more well-known to other people, because I think it's, it's a project worth taking on and it's open to anybody's contribution. So I think, People just need to know more about it. And I'm really happy that so far the, the response has been somewhat positive. Yeah. So how long have you been working? And this is a, again, for people that don't know, this is a, a film. Pro Why don't you describe the project a bit so people know yeah. what we're talking about before we sure. get into it? Yeah, I can maybe I can tell a little bit of the story too. So I, I've been following Bitcoin for a while and... I was always a little bit of uh, annoyed with the um, with the really basic representations of the the key concepts surrounding Bitcoin. They were presented in the article headers and in documentaries, and I think it's been evolving a lot. And I'm I'm trying trying to keep uh, references from everything I find because I think ultimately we're going to have to kind of figure it out collectively. Even though everybody has a personal view of Bitcoin to develop a, an idea of what Bitcoin is. It's something that we're going to have to come up as a group. So I'm finding everybody's representations of blockchain, Bitcoin, networks, networks of data, networks of nodes, um, some things that are present in biology, how, how things interact with each other in physics. And I'm trying to parse that into a representation of Bitcoin. How long have you been work, working on it? Uh, it's hard to define when it started, but I I have a tweet that I was kind of trying to test the waters that I think it's from 2020, where I'm just trying to see if there's any appetite out there to have other people have visual assets that allow them to kind of create a visual identity of what Bitcoin is as a whole and not just as like a chart of price or a logo type or someone's crazy app. It can be anything and everything, but ultimately there's an essence that can be captured through the protocol, the code, the data. Is there, because I, I went through the, the film site, you know, and, and there you, you kind of break it down into different chapters or sections and you have some visuals uh, developed already. And then you have some commentary associated with them. And then you have kind of some notes about how you'd like the it to be animated or how like to be displayed. Um, is there, I mean, you call it the anatomy of Bitcoin, presumably for a reason, because you're kind of looking at how this, just like a body, like a complex system of cells and organs and all this kind of stuff comes together to create a, a functioning system. But is there, um, an underlying, uh, you know, creative or, uh, conceptual theme beyond that, that is kind of guiding any of your attempts to develop imagery for the different components of Bitcoin? Yeah, so the <laughs> there's there's one big component. So the the idea would be to have this film project be all data based. So imagine you're running a node and you can run a, a Blender program, which is a 3D open source program, and you can just somehow seamlessly connect this program to your node and render the whole network that's visible from your node all the blocks, all the bits, they're ordered in the right way. And the the bits become transactions, the transactions become blocks, the blocks become a chain, the chain is inside the node. It's composed of messages. And imagine that you can do this all with real data. The data would be represented with ultimately zeros and ones, which defines the kind of ethos of representation of everything that's present in the film would all be represented by a cube that is either emitting light or not emitting light. So you have zero being null 
or false and you have the one being true or um, something it's the opposite of nothing and you build everything is based on that obviously then there's more metaphysical ideas like value and even representing the the fiat network is a little bit more subjective because it's so mysterious and it's impossible to render from data because we don't have access to any real data so there's a <laughs> a component of the film that i'm really excited to be able to develop through code so all the directions to the characters the characters being the geometry that compose the system those can be commanded via code so we tell them to be a cube is here at this frame and then it's going to animate rotate and ease into another position in this frame so just like a director tells the actors to say stuff and move around our set is kind of digital and we command everything as much as possible through code because ultimately you want everybody to be able to look at the script the same way they look at bitcoin so the, the development of the project itself tries to uh, imitate the development of the Bitcoin project as much as possible. So to try to keep it as open source as possible, try to use all the tools as much open source as possible and use the real data, the realest of data is that anybody can just take the code and connect it to their node or connect it to someone else's node and you would render, everybody would render exactly the same. Unless you decide to tweak it and you're welcome to evolve that code. So we can then take it back to the film project and maybe keep updating the film as our understanding of Bitcoin evolves. Yeah, I mean, so we all, in our attempts to understand Bitcoin or understand anything, like we, we necessarily need some manner of conceptualizing an idea in our mind, right? And then it's that the degree of clarity we have over that conceptualization, how quote unquote true it is, goes a long way to our to facilitating our capacity to engage with that conceptualization, whether it's an idea or a technology or or whatever. And so the greater clarity on the truth of the thing we're trying to conceptualize that we have, presumably the more fruitfully we can engage it, you know, and again, this applies for pretty much everything. And as I'm going through the, the slides or the initial, uh, you know, images for this film, you know, I'm thinking like, wow, how much will this enhance our capacity to conceptualize this thing that is Bitcoin? Now, as you say, I mean, like, what is Bitcoin, right? There, there'll be innumerable, you know, definitions of that, but clearly your in in being creative and in putting forth a, a, a manner of conceptualizing it, you're asserting something about it. You're asserting a certain form. You're asserting a certain concept, conceptualization. What do you think or hope will be the impact when this is done and people are confronted with this manner of conceptualizing it? Do you think it will enrich their understanding, affect how they in, engage with Bitcoin, affect their understanding of Bitcoin, all those sorts of things? Like, do, is that the the hope or the purpose, or if not, do you think it will be one of the outcomes? That's certainly the hope. And I I certainly think that this project has the potential to uh, affect some people in different ways. So there's definitely the component of representing Bitcoin, which I've come to recognize that it's an obsession for a lot of people. And a lot of people have no visual tools to... There's no... There's no co coherent image that forms in their minds when they're talking about this. I don't know if they're talking when when people talk about Bitcoin, they probably just like visually memorize themselves using a wallet, clicking around or hanging out with other Bitcoiners. I don't know exactly what people are thinking when they think Bitcoin. Maybe they just have a flash of the, the logo that's more common with the tilted serif B. But I think there's room for people for people's minds to be influenced the same way that you're kind of with every Bitcoin transaction, you're pushing bits into everybody's nodes and those bits are going to be there forever. I think by pushing bits into screens, you can uh, create images in front of people that are going to be through their retina. It's going to be like 
incepted in their brain forever. Potentially, this will be the image that people think. Like when, when people think about God, there's all kinds of imagery that shows up. Some people are more minimal, think of crosses. Some people think of uh, fallen angels, uh, Mother Earth. Uh, but in, in the end, a lot of people think of the Sistine Chapel. That's the most iconic representation of God because I think it puts it next to a man, gives it scale. But it is, in the end, just a, the church's interpretation of what God is in that moment in history. Mm -hmm. You go through history and everybody has different conceptions of God. The Egyptians have their own, like Aboriginal tribes have their own. Um, I think in the end, we tend to almost always recognize that there's some divinity in the sky and the stars. So that's also because that's why it's interesting to put Bitcoin in this context where it's all dark and it's the light of the bits that actually il illuminates the atmosphere and the environment in which we're going to create the narrative to explain Bitcoin. Because ultimately, it's the star. The star is an icon for everybody. Uh, the communists, the Christians, everybody loves the star. The Jewish people love the star. So it's taking that more recognizable iconography from all history and all, all humankind and trying to make that star kind of appropriated by Bitcoin and becomes kind of paint with the light of Bitcoin. But it's... But Bitcoin is actually just an abstraction. It just lives on hard drives. There's no actual glowing bits going right. anywhere. Well, you know, it's fascinating how, as you say, we to conceptualize the infinite, the the unknowable force that you know you may call God, we always look up, right? Because the up is conceptually to us infinite, and we always characterize it as as light whether it light of the a star the sun illuminating internally because that it's the process of bringing more into yourself right illuminating the space of mm -hmm. meaning of value of your own potential of your own own capacity you know and, and so of course that's that's uh, represented with light and conversely like we we conceptualize you know down is finite down is earth. We can know this. We can feel the soil. We can measure things, right? And so that's the finite world. And so, of course, we always look, you all, we always conceptualize the unknowable as mm -hmm. infinite, and we look up because that's the conceptual space for that. And it's interesting how, you know, you, you bring up a point, and it's so it's such an interesting point because, we're you know, so many of us are so enamored with this thing that is Bitcoin, and we're, we're it's so, it's become so meaningful to us. And we, we, it seems, like you know you can you can attempt to understand it forever and there's you'll always find different nooks and crannies of what it means and its value and its significance to you and all this kind of stuff and but it's such an interesting question like well what is when you say bitcoin when you say bitcoin is meaningful to to you when you say bitcoin has you know transformed or impacted your life in some positive way like what do you mean by bitcoin and it's, mm -hmm. as you say, it's the same in the, in the religious domain. It's like, what do you mean by God? What do you mean by Christ? And the, the, un unfortunately, I would say, I mean, there's some, there's some utility in being able to just say a word and have the other person know at least to some degree what you're referring to, right? Because that, that constitutes the basis of your capacity to communicate and understand one another. But it, it, it's unfortunate in the sense that because of that general acceptance, you're not pressed as much to really clarify that conceptualization mm -hmm. internally. Because again, I, I do think there's great benefit to be derived from gaining ever greater clarity on how you conceptualize the things that most impact you, let's say. And so whether that be the notion of God or Christ, or whether that be the abstraction that is Bitcoin, it seems to me to be the case that the more clarity we can get on them, the more we can invite whatever their beneficial capacity is into our lives for the, you know, the more we can be illuminated by them, let's say, because we have a greater, the, the territory of their significance inside of us has been expanded. We see it with greater clarity. And that means we can maneuver through that territory better. Um, and so to the extent that these abstractions allow us to communicate, it's good, to the extent that they allow us to kind of be lazy 
uh, or be less rigorous in our attempts to fully or more clearly conceptualize them to ourselves, I would say it's it's kind of a negative. Um, so, which is why, you know, I think your project is, is so fascinating because, and again, I'm super excited for it because just after having, you know, spent some time on the website, I can really see how that will greatly facilitate that, that process of gaining greater clarity over how we conceptualize this thing. Um, so I guess, you know, one, one of my, my selfish questions is when, when's it, when's it going to be done? Is there, is there a date where this might be, you know, available to consume? Well, it's it's always available because I'm releasing everything as I go, and I'm trying to now, like I, I try to release in different places at different times, just to to kind of also try to involve more people and have a discussion before everything goes public, and also I'm trying to to also build up a little presence on Noster, so stuff that gets posted there doesn't get posted on Twitter. But uh, I think it will be done whenever it's done. I think there's there's still a ton of work to do. I think everything I have so far, I think it's been really fulfilling to build because I also learned a lot and I'm learning constantly. I have I have all the sections that I want to cover, the ones that are exciting me the most, but I'm still kind of not touching them because I think... I think I need to go in stages is when it goes deeper into the cryptography and how that can re be represented. The mathematics behind Bitcoin, which I think are very complex, but can be explained in more simple terms. Uh, there's a way to visualize the elliptic curve cryptography in places that I've seen in uh, mathematical forums that can be, again, appropriated into Bitcoin and we can use them to explain how exactly where is this your secret is hidden because i think people at least this happened to me my conviction over bitcoin only grows when i understand it more i mm. i've never lost conviction in bitcoin for after finding another thing that became a little bit more clear so i want to work on that invite other people to work with me, invite other people to pay me for working on the thing that we're already all doing for free, which is trying to discover Bitcoin. So I can provide a valuable asset that can be viewed in a family or piecemeal as it gets developed or by yourself. Even yeah. put it in a VR system to kind of combat the whole idea of a meaningless metaverse. You bring the idea of a grounded metaverse that actually changes with the physical physical uh, mining of Bitcoin will affect how you then explore the the blockchain in your little VR set, and you don't need to go to crazy unicorn city. Right. <laughs> um, when you say you know, like you say you're excited about doing certain aspects aspects of this, I imagine it's the case that as you gone through it your own understanding of bitcoin or what you appreciate about it or the different intricacies has uh you know developed greatly because you're getting mm -hmm. into such not only because you're getting into such minute detail about how it works but also in your attempt to uh take you know how it works and move it in like infuse it with your own creativity to put it into a form that maybe simplifies it or or makes it click with the other ways you've represented different the you know, other components of it that that also i would imagine is like incredibly uh you know invigorating or productive towards your your own understanding and conceptualizing of this thing so is that the case like as you yeah, go you, you, you continue to understand more absolutely because i'm trying to use the rules of bitcoin to dictate the how the geometry gets laid out so in a sense it's actually satoshi that's directing everything i'm just like line producing the thing on stage so for what instance, you... I can... hmm? sorry go i was gonna say what do you mean by using the rules of bitcoin to dictate the ge geometry so i'll give you an example an example i think the easiest most simple pure form of representing bitcoin would just be a string of zeros and ones aligned almost like going around the earth multiple times with the whole string with the, with the whole string of the blockchain there that would be the most pure and simple way of representing the chain of blocks 
but that's not a very interesting way and it's not very meaningful for a bitcoiner to look at zeros and ones even though a lot of people already can detect that six zeros after and then a one and then multiple zeros that's the the genesis block and the hash of the previous block that's zero because there's none but if you take that and you organize it into cubes so you start breaking and you start ordering the string of numbers to to form a cube and organize as a cube and then create another block and distance itself based on the time it took to mine now you can start seeing a little bit more meaning in that because now you have the time of the blocks so the the physical world is now represented in the space now you can go and spiral those blocks into sets of 2016 and now you have a spiral with the difficulty adjustment and then you can stack them together until it forms a helix and you have a full turn is a having and then you keep turning the helix so it forms this kind of shape of sandwiched sandwiched spirals stacked together to form a helix so you can see you can compress and it's like the dna code the dna code in in the end is just a string of four variables but it coils and it organizes in ways to fit inside the cell it can't just be a line it would puncture the the cell cannot sustain that it needs to round and become more of a natural form given the laws of physics it just chooses itself to go into the helix and then coil into those little more i don't know the norm, the names but eventually it forms the the whole chromosome and there's really interesting videos you can go on youtube and see all these zooms out of the the most smallest piece of matter to the biggest and everything yeah. in between yeah yeah and it really puts things at scale because we're this is also almost a very it's a very human centric way of things but of seeing things but it looks like we're somewhere in the middle where you have the infinitely big and the infinitely small and there's this same aspect that i think it's interesting in uh, in physics or in nature that i think can be also transposed to bitcoin so yeah yeah well i i love those um like magnify in and zoom out sort of visuals because you know obviously they just give you a sense for how enormous the scale of our existence is and also it just makes you think like let's say you zoom out 10 orders of magnitude i mean if there was somehow a consciousness at that level they would never think that there was consciousness at our level that had meaning and love mm -hmm. and creativity because it's just it's it's so infin infinitesimally small to them and so the same just necessarily has to be true for us, right? Like, how do we know there's not civilizations like growing in the dirt under our fingernails, you know, mm -hmm. at some level, because it's so, we're so many orders of magnitude larger than that, that we would, you know, of course we could, we, we couldn't even perceive it, you know, and then you get into like multidimensional stuff and everything. It just goes crazy, but bring it a little bit more brought down to earth, but still somewhat uh, of a mind bender is, has this way of conceptualizing what is ultimately just information, data, ones and zeros, um, and seeing you know how you condense it to form that way. And then as you say, making that comparison to DNA as basically just information as well and information condensed in a format that allows it to execute in the way that it does in, in human biology or in biology generally. Um, has that has the comparison there or the contrast or looking at at data condensed or construed in in two similar ways like that influenced your view of human biology versus cybernetic data architecture or structures and you know yeah maybe I, maybe I there's similarities there that we haven't really been it definitely exploring, definitely exploring affected yet. for me it definitely affected because i had no conception of some of these systems in the human body or in nature until I had to go and find references to the stuff I wanted to build for the film. So it it was the, the necessity of representing Bitcoin that prompted me to actually research more into how, for instance, like some 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 cellular beings build a flagella by like this is a 
bordering on the speculative. This is how they think it's built by taking all the molecules and through physical ma magnetics, it just forms this little arm that then twists to make a body move at a microscopic level. And I thought, well, this is <laughs> everything is there for a reason and things need to be, they already existing in that environment. All the, the data with all the nutrients, they already exist in that environment, but it, it takes a being to take some code to sort those molecules, to put them in an order that it's going to function as a motor and then as a tail to rotate. And they need to be in that specific order, otherwise it won't work. And it's it's finding the, the type of thing in nature that kind of made me so interested in the in this fact that uh, the Bitcoin data is only truthful because it's sorted, it's zeros and ones sorted in a way. And you change one sort, it breaks everything. So it needs to be absolute. And there's only two elements and those elements are binary just because that's what we need. We don't need, because it's an imaginary space. It's, it's in the data space. It's not in nature. We don't need a lot of molecules. We have this, either it is or it isn't. And from there we build transactions and we build blocks. But ultimately in the, we only need, it's like almost the, the divine trinity. You only need the bit zero one and the set. Those are the three units that you need to run Bitcoin. The set? Because, hmm? You said the zero, the one, and the set. Is that what you said? And the set, the Satoshi, the the, oh. the smallest, the, the value that you, like the reason why all that data is sorted, it's to move that value from one place to the other. So the, it's the Satoshis that give any meaning to that gibberish that a lot of people don't, a lot of people look at the blockchain and they don't see anything of value because they don't understand what's there because it's it reads as noise. But if you sort everything and if you translate into human language, then you see, oh shit, this is this is a ledger of all the value of the world. But if you look at it with just zeros and ones, it just looks like noise. Unless you highlight the important parts and then mm. that noise becomes meaningful. When you see a lot of zeros, that's a coin-based transaction because it's consuming an output that didn't exist. So th those zeros... For someone that doesn't understand Bitcoin, are meaningless. But for a Bitcoiner, it's like the the immaculate conception of each Coinbase from nothing. You know, and... it's sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, you know, the, these comparisons always make me think. You know, and I, 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 I it's probably my uh, opinion at this point that everything is kind of fractally reflected, right? We were just talking about these images where you take, you know, you're looking at something on earth and you zoom out all the way, mm -hmm. or you zoom, zoom in all the way. And no matter which way you go, you see the same structural patterns represented, right? Like a common one would be, um, you know, the structure of uh, neurotransmitters in your brain and then mycelium, you know, connections in the earth and then how, you know, galactic super uh, clusters connect to each other you know, and, and they all look very similar. Or another one is like the iris in your eye and a, uh, you know, a, a, some sort of uh, dust cloud in, in space. Like you're seeing things represented in a very similar way, no matter what scale you're looking at things. And so it kind of conjures up these notions that some similar ordering principle is operating on every single level, just at a different scale. And the same is true when I when I look at information, you know, like you, if you go down to the level of DNA, you say, okay, well, it's just information and it's structured to execute in a certain way. And then you have like, what brings it to life? What, what animates it? And, and, you know, for human beings, it's, well, what, what's the source of life, right? What is that oomph that, what is that spark of life? What is that energy that causes that machinery to activate and ex execute? Is that the logos? Is that the spirit of God? Is that whatever spark of life energy that, you know, who knows where it ultimately comes from, whatever. And, you know, you see a very obvious corollary to the extent we've been discussing here today with Bitcoin, right? Like you have all this, this information here that that's executable, and then you need 
that spark that animates it. And in this case, maybe you say that spark is just like actual electricity, you know, just to, to ex execute the the, com the computer code and that kind of thing. But it's it's just so interesting how we see a very similar architecture or pattern just emerging like everywhere, you know, that we that we kind of wherever we place our consciousness, right? Wherever we observe, and maybe it's just us, you know, maybe those patterns are more about us than they are about, you know, anything objective out in the world. But it certainly seems to be the case that we see these recurring patterns, you know, binary itself is another one, you know, like you, you look at, um, well, duality has been a philosophical and theological concept, you know, for all of human history, you know, the yin and the yang, uh, you know, God and the devil, day and night, sun and moon, you know, it, it, there's always this like equally opposing things. And then, of course, if now that we are involved in constructing worlds, let's say in digital landscapes, we have have discovered that the basis on which to construct worlds that make sense, that are coherent, that are logical, logically consistent or have the capacity for that are once again introducing duality as a basis for that world, which is, is it a one or is it a zero? And based off of, of those opposing conceptions, you can create an entire universe, whether it's the one we create in digital landscapes or whether it's the one that we're actually in, which is, you know, reality as we know it. And it's just, it's so fascinating to see the recurrence of, of, of those themes or conceptualizations. Yeah, it's, I, I agree completely. And I think even... There's a, even a little bit of a fractal loop that I think I was very excited to uh, kind of finding in Bitcoin because I totally agree with you. I think ultimately the universe is all ruled by the same rules. The microscopic rules are the same rules that uh, govern the the rules that move galaxies around. We just see it from our own perspective and we are tremendously privilege to have the telescope and the microscope to actually expand our perspective so deep but then if we look inwards and i believe that's kind of what the cyberspace is because for an alien or for a dog i'm just talking in front of this device over a reflecting screen that has lights there's a, a space between you and i that goes through the telecommunication systems of the world that makes sense to me and i choose to respond to whatever you say from that side because i believe that there's, there's a real person there but that's happening in my mind that's the cyberspace this is a someone that doesn't understand internet from the medieval times would think i'm crazy mm. but this is the space we did create from scratch based on information alone so it's only reasons that the zeros and ones are the most efficient way to build information from scratch. You cannot, I mean, you can try, I guess you can try to build with a trinary or a whatever system that has, but you can build the hexadecimal system with binary. So the, the hex code that everybody is familiar with, it's just a compression of the, you know, are you familiar with the, obviously with the Genesis code? Mm -hmm. the, the the hexadecimal dump of the hex of the Genesis block has two columns with eight bytes each and then has the column with the ASCII translation. That's just a translation. The ASCII translation is just an interpretation of the hexadecimal, but the hexadecimal is just an interpretation of the, of the bits, of the zeros and ones. Mm -hmm. It just takes 16 zeros and ones to build one ASCII character. So to write... The the uh, chancellor on the brink of second bailout to banks, each of those characters required sixteen bits, but ultimately the bits are the 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 building block of everything. Much in the same way that somewhere inside the atom, there's the building block for all the other elements. Well, I don't I think... know where it stops. <laughs> maybe it doesn't i mean most likely it doesn't but isn't that the reason why you know a few moments ago you said you, the reason you like one of the the basis for conceptualizing what you're doing is either like a dark block or a light emitting block because you know basically that's the fundamental contrast either like you, you know it flips or it doesn't flip 
You mm -hmm. get light or you get darkness. And just that, the com all the different combinations that you can make from like positive, negative, yes or no, happening, not happening, light or dark, all the combinations that you can make from that. Well, what we're discovering is that you, you can, the world emerges from that. I mean, that that's mm -hmm. kind of the basis of the philosophy of duality, right? It's like, that is so fundamental that just based off of that, something and its opposite, you can cre like reality exists and creation is possible because of that. You know, and we, in, in, in referencing things like the Trinity in all the different ways you might find it. I mean, in, in the digital landscape, in the informational landscape, you might just say the Trinity is like the one, the zero and the force that animates it, right? The father, son, and mm -hmm. the Holy spirit, you know, the, again, like, I don't mean to denigrate any, any, you know, religious people that are listening, but like, again, you see these patterns. And I, I think actually it, it, it kind of affirms those ideas wherever we might find them in, in the religious domain or otherwise, that they are so consistently observable in so many other domains. I think it affirms the veracity of them in, in, to a large degree. Now we might, we might, um, you know, there might be some contention, like where the primacy or supremacy of any particular representation of that dynamic, um, like which one is the most authoritative, let's say, but I think the, a lot of, uh, they garner a lot of validity simply by the fact that they're so observable in so many different ways, like on the fundamental or on the, at the foundation of so many things. Yeah. And even, and even the, the, the whole Trinity in the Christian, um, religion, I think I'm not super familiar with other, I'm not, I don't study religion, but from what I've seen, I, 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 I totally agree. There's, there's a lot of overlap. And I think from, from the Christian perspective, I've always, or not always, but more recently have come to kind of understand the, the Holy Trinity as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost as kind of, we you can be all of them together at the same time or at different stages in your life. You're obviously not born a father, you're born a son, but you could also be a daughter, you could be a mother, and the Holy Ghost is whatever uh, human spirit we have. And that Trinity can, it's it's a human component. I don't think it's a, it's a Christian or religious component. It just depends on where you are in life and whether you feel which energy you're going to take more from. If you're feeling more like victimizing yourself, you'll probably default to the, to the sun uh, archetype or the sun, the that point in the triangle, or you can tend to go to, to more of the fatherly figure. If you're feeling responsible for other people, or you go to the Holy ghost, if you're kind of questioning both or wanting to go in a different direction. And and that's how I kind of see also the the that thing in Bitcoin is you have you have truth, which is represented by the a cube filled with energy that was intentionally filled to mean something. And you have the cube that's empty that has been left empty as like the vessel for that energy. And then you have the Satoshi or the unit, whatever you want to call it, represented by a sphere. And that sphere is kind of, can be either glowing or not glowing. It has an intensity, it has a gradient of color because that's the value you prescribe to the Satoshi. So if you don't care about Bitcoin, you're going to see that sphere dimmed. But if if you're already valuing Bitcoin at whatever a trillion dollars, you're going to be that, seeing that sphere much more bright because that's how much storage it's is stored in that unit of satoshi globally and shared we all decide in the market that that satoshi has this value in the beginning the satoshis let's imagine that there were all spheres that were pretty much a neutral gray yeah because then there's also another component that i believe that that value represented in that sphere can also go negative which is if you enter into debt and you go into fiat and you start counterfeiting money, that, that's a negative value. And to your point earlier, when you're talking about up or down, we look to the sky up to kind of find divinity, but there's also kind of weird shit happening below level. You go into the mines and if you dig deeper, you find yourself in the inferno 
and that's where usually the bad people, the dirty people go, <laughs> because up is usually good and down is bad. So there's also some representation of energy in the. I have this scene that I'm working on that's just a human shape that's filled with particles representing value. And either those particles are pulled down and they become darker mm. because they're being pulled down by the weight of that and the fiat that actually converges at the center of the, the planet because it's it's centralized. It's it's a centralized system. So there's a hierarchy that's kind of like a tree. Imagine that multiple trees growing from the center of the earth that branch out into everybody, every single soul in the world has some debt. Maybe it's not to the bank, but they can choose to move their value up into the Bitcoin network that's no center, that sits above. It's like a satellite network that sits around and uh, kind of wraps around the, the planet. And obviously this is to give this, it's in our perspective of human beings living on Earth because everybody recognizes the image of Earth. And if you pinpoint... And if you then locate them based on geography, based on, for instance, population density or amount of nodes that are run in each city, then you can give people a, a sense of scale. So now you can move the camera in and out of the world and show what could be you represented in your kind of vessel of energy with either something sucking down the energy or something that's elevating their energy if you run a node your energy gets lifted up into the the ethereal space of the node network and if you choose to run tor then you become even more elevated it's like these different levels but if you also choose to leave your bitcoin in a custodial exchange that then is tied to a bank that's tied to a central bank, that's tied to a central bank of central banks and whoever is at the center, then your value is always going to be be pulling down to grow the center as mm. opposed to grow the edge. Yeah, I, I love that. You know, I love the notion of conceptualizing how debt slavery limits you or enslaves you and how Bitcoin frees you, you know, and using that, the, the kind of like, taking all the the energy molecules and like putting them down near the feet to convey that you're born, you're literally born with that into, into bondage effectively. You know, you're, mm -hmm. even if you don't take on any personal debt, like, well, if you're born into the United States, there's an amount mm -hmm. of debt on your head, whether you like it or not. And that, and you know, money is a reflection of energy. Money is an emblem of our time and our sacrifices. And so that, that you have a, monetary debt placed on your head just by virtue of being born in a particular system that is automatically a shackle like just straight up and as you're saying and as we talk about in the space all the time once you begin to unshackle yourself with bitcoin and as you're saying doing it in the proper ways you know so unshackling yourself as much as is possible and, and i think this is why we talk about i you know I obviously talk about the philosophy and, you know, the even spiritual aspects of Bitcoin more because like, what does it mean to feel more free? I mean, that's a very deeply spiritual, theological, philosophical concept because it's, you know, what is freedom? What is, you know, that your capacity to actualize your potential or pursue, to engage your will you know, to the maximum extent to pursue whatever is most meaningful to you. And that has a very uplifting and keep, you know, effect on people. It has a very energizing effect on people. It has a very invigorating effect on people. Whereas the opposite, when you're, when you're born into those shackles and you never break free from them and that you just keep being further shackled by all the different mechanisms of well, one, coping with those shackles, you know, bad food, substance abuse, whatever it might be. And then the pylon of 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 the system of shackles that you're you're uh, that are imposed upon you or that you're subject to just makes it worse and worse and worse. And how does that feel? Well, that feels horrible. You feel lazy, you feel apathetic, you feel you lack of energy, you feel dark. You know, so there's a reason why we use all these words and all these metaphors to describe and conceptualize all the things in our lives, because they're very real. The impact that we like, we feel them. 
We feel them energetically. We feel them emotionally. We feel them hormonally. That's why we use the words to represent them. And I think it's a great idea to, to, cause as you're saying, like showing a body and showing where the energy moves as a result of being under certain systems or engaging certain solutions or protocols pushes that energy up more towards the top, right up more towards the head, giving that sense of, of lightness yeah. and, li and liberation. And that's, that's the point. And it's very real. Like the, to our point earlier, it's like, you're not just conceptualizing it because it's a fun thing to do. Conceptualizing it that way allows us to grapple better with the truth of it and engage that better. And hopefully, you know, as a result, uh, bring the the benefit of that truth more so into our lives. So I'm, I'm fucking pumped, man. I can't wait to see this. <laughs> There's the, the, and, and so I, I, I do these, I have a, a, a notebook and I do some sketches and, um, and I realized the other day that actually the, if, if, if the value flows to the top, when you like connect to the, to the cyberspace and run a node, the node doesn't actually store the value because the Bitcoin are not, your Bitcoin is not stored in the node. The node only stores the data. So even more glowing than the bits of zeros and ones or the ones is actually the value, that energy, that psychological energy, the human capital that's represented by those, those particles that then once you elevate them uh, through Bitcoin, it actually gets stored in your brain. The brain Usually when people depict uh, God or Jesus or the saints, they create a hollow around their their head as their mm. head is lit up by the divine or the Holy Spirit. So I hope it doesn't sound erratic for uh, religious people, but I'm, I'm taking a lot of inspiration from that those representations because ultimately when you're storing the secret in your brain, that's ultimate illumination of your brain in this representation system it is your brain that's glowing the most obviously your body is also glowing because i believe the the whole nervous system is part of the brain the memory is stored mm -hmm. everywhere in the body and ultimately you also have your physical energy that also is part of your full human capital because just having a being in a coma with bitcoin in your brain is not very useful mm those two forces the it, it is the knowledge of that stored value in your brain that will move you and will and like the shackles and the and kind of the the thing that creates roots onto the center it will make you more stuck this will allow you to have more energy to move around and do the things that you might want to do right but but you you touched on an interesting point that was um the 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 shackles that uh, we are born with, we're, they're born we're born with because of obviously the political and economical context, but there's also a lot of cultural context that shackles us because, in terms of freedom, it, it, that's a very relative standard. You might think you're free, and some people might look at you and say you're. <laughs> You don't even want to be free. To be free is to live in a boat in the middle of the sea, or to be free is to have your own farm, or to be free is to have a Ferrari, or to be free is to have Netflix. Everybody has different ideas of what it is to be free. And I think ultimately that standard is set by all the, the culture we consume. And there's definitely, I don't see anybody, there, there is a lot of people making Bitcoin content, obviously. But you don't see any big studio implementing big budget to to make 3D on Bitcoin. They're making 3D on uh, Marvel heroes. Uh, these uh, non-existing heroes that are supposedly trying to create a model for young people to follow. But I don't think it's very realistic. So in the end, it turns... I think it's kind of useless. But I'm just... To transition a little bit to the to the world of movie financing and what it is, there's another aspect of this project that I thought would be interesting to discuss, which is the the way it's being developed as a film, as content. In the Bitcoin context, because the holders of Bitcoin are, are all over the world, 
potentially the market to donate and help make this movie is everybody. But on the other end, the film is being offered for free and open source. So the monetization model becomes interesting because the only thing you, if you're making a film like this, the only thing you really have to offer back to a person that wants to put money is either you get credit or you get some kind of like pre-release content, which I'm, I don't, I don't love st stuff like that. Pre-releases and exclusive releases and uh, paywalls, I think would hurt the project more than anything. And so I I'm interested, I'm only bringing this up because I've been hearing a lot more people coming from media and film joining the Bitcoin uh, kind of active movement. And I would just like to leave the invitation for people to, if you have some movie skills to produce, to do 3D, to code and to distribute whatever you need to do to make a film, because I never made a film. This is, I, I'm learning as I go. Um, there, I think there's a big opportunity here because I think there's also willingness for people to put money to see this happening. I'm just not the great salesperson. I'm not the great kind of producer and organizer of people. I just like to see it in front of my computer and look at data and try to make interesting geometry with it. Um, but there is a whole way to finance a movie, I think, through Bitcoin, where you don't need to submit to the to the studio that has shekels themselves mm. they also have to pay their loans and the the banks are looking at the content they produce and those banks are responsible to to other creditors and those creditors are looking at what companies these banks are investing in sure. so the the message coming out there through hollywood productions and netflix productions they they have there's an underlying agenda behind that that goes all the way to the top of where the money starts flowing and it trickles down only to certain projects totally or or if they say certain things how much do you think it would cost to to do the movie do the film um hmm. i don't know i've been so i've been working with bitcoin magazine and they've been kind of helping me uh, de dedicate some time to this while I I'm working on on stuff for them, and I'm then I they I also use the the conference to kind of broadcast a little bit of this, um, and I, at the same time I'm using the geometry to help with other stuff that gets. So, uh, do you did you see you went to Miami right? Uh, this year. Yes, I wasn't at the conference. No. Oh, okay. So, but maybe you saw. So you saw. He saw the geometry used in the backstage. That geometry was taken, some parts were taken from the project. So currently the financing of the project is my time and some Bitcoin magazine is paying for some other time. But give me a ballpark. Like, what, what do you think? Like 100K, 200K, a million? I have on the website, I put, I put five Bitcoin, knowing that there's a progress bar. Right. And when I put the, the limit of five Bitcoin, I thought... Either I'm going to fill this up immediately because everybody's going to see the value or it's going to take me decades to fill this up to <laughs> five Bitcoin. So at the end, when it reaches five Bitcoin, who knows how much Bitcoin is going to be worth. Right. But I imagine... Give me, like, give, give me a current US dollar amount just, just so we can have I an would idea. Say, of like I would say saying. like, I think it can be done with my experience let's say it would take me just my time alone doing what I've been doing and coordinating with the people that have been co collaborating, like 300K because, okay. and in the course of maybe two, three years. And that money would be obviously to pay my expenses and to pay my lifestyle mm -hmm. <laughs> and to pay everybody else's lifestyle that I would be bringing in because there's a lot of people interested in contributing, but I cannot ask them to just drop their day job. They've already contributed for free. And in some cases, I give some of my Bitcoin just to keep them excited and to also pay for their time because I've had contributions that saved me a lot of time mm. doing stuff, writing codes and writing, um, uh, just uh, dealing with Blender with stuff that 
it was very valuable and it was actually cheap the amount of value i got back but i yeah, imagine yeah. that pretty, yeah i'm just gonna say you know a few minutes ago you you said like um basically you know you're saying well freedom means different things to different people right it's netflix versus it's no debt versus it's living in the mountains whatever and i totally agree but i also see i mean and, and also the reason why we've always engaged narrative and story, whether it was like cave paintings 70,000 years ago, or it's the Marvel universe today. It's like, there's a lot wrapped up in them. But one of the things I think is like conceptualizing freedom. Like, what is it to be free? Whether you're one of the people being saved by the superhero, right? So you're oppressed in some way, the super superhero frees you. Now you can live a happy, peaceful life. Or whether you're the superhero himself and you know you're you're dealing with concepts of courage and freedom and love and you know all these kinds of things i mean that's the point of story right to kind of elucidate these things and you're right that um i mean we're only 14 years in right so th that narrative storytelling hasn't come too much to bitcoin yet but the the, the caveat i would say is over the last couple of years i've seen a lot of movement on that front and so i just think you know, and it's still small scale because there's not a lot of money behind them. And, you know, people are doing these things voluntarily or open source or what have you. Mm -hmm. So the projects have been smaller. Maybe they've been comic books or maybe they've been, you know, shorter videos or whatever. But again, if we, if we just look at what we're dealing with here and the significance of what we're dealing with and the evolution thus far over 14 years, I don't think it's a very big leap at all to suggest. No, no, it's, I think that, it's a matter of. It's just a matter of time, right? We're yeah. going to have massive budget storytelling efforts around this thing again it goes back to our initial point it's because we we know there's something of, of tremendous value here we don't really know what it is yes we can point to some things separate money and state you know efficient markets freedom you know financial freedom all this kind of stuff but again we're, we're still in the process of conceptualizing just what this thing is and what it really means and your efforts and the efforts of, of storytelling generally are one of the main ways in which we facilitate that process, right? It makes it real. It makes it emotional. It makes it relatable. It makes it, you know, you anthropomorphize it. And this is how we, we get to understand this thing better. And so, the, and because that is such a, a fundamental demand, I think there's going to be so much appetite for creative efforts that facilitate that process. And so, you know, I, punchline being, I think you're just early, but um, one, so you, you have two options, basically, like may, you, you do it up, you you bear the cost, and then you try to sell it to a platform because it's that compelling. And, you know, that's still a model that works in, in today's day and age, and maybe that would work. The other one, as far as I can tell, is, you know, you you try to open source it as you are, you try to get the word out there, you try to show enough that, to get people excited that they contribute to some of the cost. And then you do a value for value thing, right? You hope that like, you know, once it's out, you know, you post it on the platforms and enough people will compensate you for your time after the fact, you know, th those, maybe there's other options, but those seem to be two obvious ones. Um, but again, I think, you know, we're in a, it's still early days, I, again, is the point, but I do think that more and more people in this space are more and more willing to support things that they deem of high quality of, you know, that are meaningful to them that, you know, I think there's an, a lot of appetite to support as much as, you know, the, the kind of hodl meme is ever present and people want to hold on to as much Bitcoin as they can. I've, my observation is that when there's genuine, like proof of work efforts put forward in the space that, that end up contributing meaningful to, to something, there's a lot of appetite for supporting them. And then, and then scale takes care of the rest, you know? So, Maybe, you know, actually, I don't even want to say this, but like at a certain scale of people that hold Bitcoin and that really, you know, the kind of maximalist mindset, not just, you know, broader people that hold a hundred bucks worth, you know, maybe supporting a $300,000 effort is challenging at the moment, but in two years, will it be in five years? Will it be, you know, that that'll continue, that number will continue growing. And that just means we're going to get more and more uh, creative efforts and we're going to get the benefits of 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 those efforts so yeah but you know, but to be, and to clarify the reason why i was hesitating uh giving that ballpark is because um so technology is evolving i just i just faced the wall just a couple of days ago that got resolved by another a launch of a new version of blender the hardware is getting faster and faster 
So the 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 film is becoming more and more efficient, and I'm also learning how to control the software more and more. And so far, I don't think you need to give a ballpark and a budget to get this done because ultimately I think the best model is the model that's been working so far, which is some people give some money and they basically, they, what they're basically telling me is here, I'm, I'm paying you to keep work on this, keep working on this. That's mm -hmm. how I perceive it. Mm -hmm. Somebody gives totally. a donation on Geyser, somebody gives a donation on BTC Pay server or some other place. The The understanding is, okay, I will keep going until donations stop or I can't afford because I also have to eat. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, there's ways of doing this even more efficiently and even more, even faster. If we want, if someone were to, was to think, I actually think this video is very, impor very important because I believe this is how I'm going to get my stubborn brother to understand Bitcoin. Then that person might be inclined to spend more money to get that film done faster, but nobody, everybody's going to benefit from that. The film is going to be done faster for everybody. Uh, but it's also very cheap. It's I'm not doing I'm not doing this out of a main a big studio with a lot of big machinery and a, a gigantic team for lighting and a gigantic team for animation. So far, it's been done with a, a small group of people. It's all pretty much hardcore Bitcoiners. Well, and we yeah. we might as well now we're, we'll keep talking for a bit, but let's just put out some destinations because people that are uh, that want to check out the work thus far, and then the people that want to contribute, why don't we, why don't you just drop that now? Because um, you know you say people will be motivated to show it to their brother, or their aunt, or the the person who's been stubborn. But like when I was going through all the the existing work thus far that's on the website, I was just like, I want this for me. You know, as we were saying, like, I, I want this for my own capacity to understand and conceptualize Bitcoin, because that's, you know, that's what I care about more than anything, for better or for worse. And so um, I think a lot of people would, would perhaps find themselves in that boat. So why don't, why don't you drop some destinations before we go on? Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess the the easiest way to find uh, something about the, the project is on anatomyofbitcoin.com. Uh, there's also Bitcoin Anatomy on Twitter. And then the geyser, the project is on also on geyser. Um, ultimately, the thing that has the most content is probably Bitcoin TV has all the best kind of videos. And Twitter, I've been putting a lot of stuff there every every time I have something worthy of showing, I show it there. So basically, I use I use Twitter and Damos uh, Noster and all these other platforms if, as if I was working for a boss and I'm just showing stuff to get right. review mm -hmm. I if i was working on my previous job i would post it on slack and ask for my team for review and comments i'm doing this on on twitter mostly that's where i get the most engagement even though it's very low and i understand that it's early and a lot of people look at this and they say okay it's a nice image but i have no idea what i'm looking at i also don't give much explanation the idea for the film would be to be a nature documentary with some voiceover explaining as minimal as possible and setting a mood. Because ultimately, I, I want this for me, but I also want it to show it to my family because I think this is how it needs to be digested for them to finally see some value in it. And right. literally, I'm having to hammer this video down into this digestible way for people that screech at the side of code so they can understand the protocol right. as a kind of visualizing this living being that everybody refers to and um and yeah and if anybody's interested in writing there's right now i'm only building the pieces but in the end someone is going to have to write the compelling story to follow along i don't know who the main character is if it's bitcoin itself or if it's the, the value itself, or if it's the world, or we we can actually, there is a human figure that's generic, so anybody can identify with them, but that human figure, we can follow that human figure through geography and space and time. So it's kind of a little bit of an open canvas in mm -hmm. um, to make a film that I think it's it's gonna be very innovative 
because it's representing one of the most in innovative technologies. So right there, just leeching off Bitcoin, it just gains all that value. Right. But Were then you... it's also, yeah. Go ahead. But then it's also done in an open source way through mostly code. So everything can be codified and it requires a little bit of a technology interest, not understanding, because I didn't understand much myself when I started. What's your background? But Is it graphic design or like computer science? It's mostly science graphic design, yes. Communications design, that's what the, the name of my course. So I always took that to heart because design, motion design, writing, that's all communication. Right. So it's... For me, I, what I understand my role to be is to find the, the best way to communicate an idea based on the idea itself, the content, the, the means of distribution, and the public. So That's awesome. If you're going to make a Bitcoin movie, obviously you're going to go to the place where Bitcoin are, where Bitcoiners are, and ask for Bitcoin because that's, that's where the most leads exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Uh, I'm not, right. I'm not going to yeah, go ahead. I'm just going to wanted to ask you about a, a section on the website. Cause you also have the timeline of money. I think it, it's, it's called. Mm -hmm. um, and man, that is, well, you started like the creation of the universe, basically. <laughs> just... Well, the sun only because I, Oh, oh right. Right. The sun I'm clear uh, and clear about the universe. I think. Right. Fair enough. I'll, I'll, I'll let that one slide. But, um, and then you go, you know, you, you, you know, you're on a timeline and you stop at many, 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 many different years all the way through, you know, like, you know, oceans forming on the planet and blah, 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 up to first cave paintings, the first, you know, represent representational statues. And then, you know, you wind up at Bitcoin. Um, what is the purpose of that? Like, is that, is that going to be involved in the film? Um, how long does it like what's the motivation behind putting it together in such granularity just to shed some light on that for me yeah um yeah that was a really fun project because uh a lot of these things i didn't know and i've been watching a lot of these little monetary tidbits appear on podcasts and our articles and i thought this would be amazing to to have a compendium of this and then when i was working on the film I, there's a scene where I'm trying to make the time lapse of value throughout history. So one layer you have controlling the population based on the movement of uh, uh, humans throughout history as, as far as you can go. And then you animate that, but you also animate the, the trade routes. And all of this will become ultimately just like particles flowing from one place to the other. But because they're we are bound to our geography, you will be able to recognize the the earth geography. But the goal is to go from formation of earth, even maybe even zoom out and start in the sun and then have a time lapse all the way to the creation of the fiat system and all the, the dead systems and all the booms and bust cycles and try to represent that with all like the granularity that's represented there. But imagine for each one of those events, you put an element on the geometry that it will attract or explode, ex expel particles. And then you time everything to the events. And then you can have a voiceover talking about since the dawn of time, we've been like fighting wars and pillaging each other, but also creating value, moving the value through trade routes. And I think there's a way to see how the, like the, the tipping points of human history with globalization uh, trade routes, um, uh, slavery routes, uh, everything. Can I ask so, you? Yeah. Sorry, if you, if you have more on that thought, go for no, it. No, just the, the, the compelling uh, thing to do that timeline was just to be informed and make sure that I wasn't saying anything that wasn't accurate. Right. Well, I think it's a super cool idea to use each one of those events at you know, and visualizing it in the way you, you just described, but it makes me want to ask you a question and I'll, I'll share maybe some of my thoughts afterwards. But when you say kind of like looking at value from the creation of the sun or the creation of, of, of earth, what do you conceptualize or construe or, or identify as value in each of those 
circumstances or as things evolve? Like, what is the, do you have a notion of a thread of value that is guiding those, those changes? Well, um, I think at this stage in the, in the world of Bitcoin, we have the, the certainty of the, the data that's finite, final, final, but then the value is completely subjective. So you, the data is absolute, but the value can be anything. So there's there's moments where value was stored in uh, bone, in gold, and that gold and that bone conceptually belonged to somebody. There were the rice stones that were co-owned by multiple people. So it's going to be that the value is, I think, where people stuff people keep to to trade for other people's times or services or goods afterwards. And that's as reductive as I can go to then be able to represent it throughout history because that's the only kind of objective way of looking at value. It's through money. That's why the timeline is called timeline of money and not timeline of value because value can be... Money is worthless if you're not in a monetary society. Yeah. You're in the middle of the desert, you value water, not dollars or gold or Bitcoin. Right. Well, it occurs to me as you're saying this, and again, I mean, this is the benefit of like visualizing. So when you talked about taking the timeline and imposing it on, you know, the, the, the threads or the points that will either expand or contract, or I can't remember exactly how you, the, ter- the words you use, but um, you know, maybe it's just as simple as, of course, you know, in one definition, you know, value is subjective, right? So, but that's kind of a non-starter for a conversation because it's like, well, sure, if it's just completely up to me. But if we look at all of these different developments from the creation of the the formation of the sun and and all the way down, even to, you know, water forming on the earth and certain organisms using that water to survive and propagate and all the way down to money. I mean, isn't, couldn't we construe or conceptualize value as just that which best converts entropy or chaos into productive order, you know? Mm -hmm. So for that early organism, it's the water, right? And that allows them to survive and propagate, et cetera. But all the way down to what you just said, I mean, what does money do, but be act as that primary or most effective mechanism at over the course of time and intersubjectively between people, turn the entropy or the chaos of our environment or existence or the all the different you know behaviors that are happening in a market and convert that into order as far as you define order, right? And so is that thread of value, whether it's in the realm of fusion and, and or fission in, in the sun or all the way down to what we construe as money, is it you know is it fair just to call it the thing which best turns entropy or chaos into productive order now the subjective element there is the productive right and so i would define productive order perhaps differently than anyone else but if we zoom again if we zoom out maybe that's the observation it's that like it's the thing that all of these di- different forces and or organisms are using to turn entropy or chaos into the most productive order yeah uh- it is ultimately all coming from the sun as pure chaos that that energy gets captured by earth and it was always there like all, everything that humans have made you know it was made with stuff that was already here on earth uh the energy technically was always here and the energy is already in the sun it just it's taking time to come to the surface to then be transmitted to earth so we can then have plants and grow cattle and uh, agriculture so we can then build buildings and then build a microchip and computers the um, but there is a, a turning point there or multiple throughout history where the even the oxygen that moves through the mitochondria to produce energy that's valuable but it's not something we chose we inherited but for instance gold is matter that we inherited. It was just there, but we did choose. So at some point, gold became so much more valuable because we chose to do so. So 
there's human, energy. Is the distinction here basically that humans are the only organism that chooses? You know, because you could say, or the only level of biology that. No, I think well, we're the so, most we're the most efficient at choosing. We well, choose the best ones. I mean, why isn't the mitochondria choosing the oxygen? I guess is where my my question is coming from. Well, we're using the mitochondria's use of oxygen to power our thinking to then conceptualize that maybe this metal is good to buy people's time in the future. But how we is need that? To, how, how is because. I guess the tricky question is how is that different from the mitochondria choosing the oxygen over the hydrogen? So they're like, well, the oxygen is better for creating the energy that I need to create here. And humans are saying, well, yeah, but the gold is better than the copper for the energy I need to store I mean, and transfer here. I guess you use that energy to come up to the thought that you're going to choose that. It's a con I think it's a conscious... I'm not, I'm not here to claim that the mitochondria has or doesn't have conscious, but we we choose bitcoin because we choose to believe in bitcoin we actually chose to dedicate time to choose, to verify whether or not it's right it's it's something that the value grows exponentially just because somebody chooses to it's the same thing with fiat we also choose to believe in fiat it's just that that's a bad choice yeah well, it's this, like the, this is the very interesting point about truth now one of the, you know, I'll definitely concede that different complexity is different at different layers, right? And, and complexity is built upon so that you get different types of, of choices and different results from choices at the level of the mitochondria versus the level of the human being versus the level of our, you know, thousand years from now, the super AI, let's say, you know, so of course that, but what's really interesting here is that you say like, we, will we choose Bitcoin, and we also choose fiat, but it's just a bad choice. But does this not necessitate an appreciation for the role of truth, right? Like, yes, we, we chose gold, but did we choose it if it was objectively the best thing we could use at money at that time in our, in our circumstance? Yes, we're, we're choosing Bitcoin, but ultimately, if it really is the best, right? Just like if oxygen really is the best for generating energy, isn't that choice almost inevitable? Now, of course, mm -hmm. certain people certain people are going to make the choice first and all that kind of stuff. But like, this is the, again, the, when I often talk about like, what does it mean that when we make a choice here in the earthly, re earthly realm, whether it's about an idea, an orienting idea or orienting philosophy, faith, or whether it's a tool we choose to use, what does it say about both our consciousness and the reality that we're interfacing with that those ideas or tools end up producing the most fruitful outcomes, right? So you might say, well, Bitcoin is, is truer. Right? I think this is, this is the assertion. I think you have to say that whatever Bitcoin is, what it represents, it is truer in that it coheres with something metaphysical because it, it has that more beneficial effect than let's say in comparison to something like fiat, because if you oriented, you know, all of your energy transfer and trade mechanisms around that, well, you get a much less beneficial outcome. You get a much more destructive, disintegrating, more harmful outcome. And so on every level of analysis, like we were saying before, what does it mean when certain things are chosen over other things and the results of those things having been chosen? And I think when things produce better results, you kind of have to say like, well, why? Why, why do we exist in a place where when you choose one thing versus another, there's a better result? You, you almost have to admit that it's, it's a result of cohering more closely, a greater congruence with something with those patterns we referred to before that are like, that constitute, you know, every different scale, you know, like cohering with that, that yeah. pattern, which you might call the thread of truth is the way it is how you um, conjure up the most beneficial outcome. And when you depart from those patterns that constitute everything up and down the scale, that's when you, that's what leads to destructive outcomes. It seems to me. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I think in the history of the development of mitochondria, there's probably a lot of uh, specimens that got flooded with other stuff that wrong. they couldn't. 
they could and they they just disappeared we mm -hmm. we have species disappearing all the time we can only imagine the amount of species that we don't even know of that are just like going extinct right now um everybody's always trying everybody's always evolving so when does even a species start and stop but we all, we have used all the tools we've gathered so far to to try to distill it so this is a distilled we're distilling truth more and more and making it more efficient and i think bitcoin is the culmination of all of this uh, ultimately a lot of these systems have evolved and get, get corrupted so the values that ones that you hold can also change who knows what if someone suddenly gives me a lot of bitcoin i'm sure that that would change me and turn me into someone different sure. but well maybe at yeah. least yeah, but at least I know that Bitcoin is grounded in that more of a stable truth because I know that the rules don't change or if they change, it's because I allow them to change. Even if I lost a little bit of control, even if collectively we allow Bitcoin to change into something that we don't really want right now, I think that can happen. Bitcoin is not immune if someone suddenly changes everything and convinces everybody to change everything it will change. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the mature, yeah. the, the, to put a capstone on my point and may, maybe I'm, well, just to, to put a little bit more clarity on it. Like, I think, remember I, I made that silly example of like the civilization under our finger, fingernail. Cause who knows, maybe mm -hmm. there's, you know, a galaxy under our fingernail and there's civilizations and stuff like that. Or if the AI is just looking at, you know, us a thousand years from now or from a different star system, they would look and say, you know, at this point in their development, they use gold. And at this point, they use Bitcoin. And it's like, they'll they'll be having the same debate. Well, did they choose to or, or, or what? It's like, well, no, they didn't choose to. It was just the best. So they just naturally mm -hmm. did over the course of time. And yes, there was the, the road to that was strewn with the bodies of, of those who didn't, you know, adopt it. But it, it, it was it was clearly the best tool for the job. So they all adopted it. Was that a choice or was that just conforming again to that point of what is most beneficial? And again, we could, we could kind of go back to the mitochondria and say like, well, did they, of course they didn't choose the oxygen, but well, it was the best thing for the job or they didn't choose it because it was just clearly the best thing for the job and maybe the only thing for the job, but it's like, yeah, but you can see kind of a similar comparison to us. And I, I again, I just, I wonder if that's just the process of the truth emerging and the and and organisms conforming to it. And so there's ones that don't conform to it and they don't end up propagating and surviving and adapting. And there's those that do conform to truth and they are the ones that end up uh that do survive and propagate. And I you know the 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 obvious question here is like well what does that mean for the notion of free will. Now, maybe we don't have time to crack into that chestnut here today, but it, it, it's an interesting component of, of that little analogy. Yeah, and my, I guess I, I the only the only counter I would argue for is then, how do you explain? So the dollar system, I guess in that framework is the most convenient way because that's how you pay taxes and everything else in your life. So the dollar has been winning just because it was the most, I, I just take a little bit of a, a, a truthful is also a, a word that I think is very human and not very in the world of physics, because I think truth is just something that we, we, we conceptualize so we can act on something. So we say, okay, what is truth? There's a wall in front of me, so I have to move. If you deny that, you just go against the wall. But the, the fact that the dollar was the most convenient uh, monetary system to navigate the world in the last couple of decades, it, it is a true statement, but it's not because it was based on truth. Or maybe it was the most fiat, it's, the most <laughs> truthful fiat. It's very tricky territory here because you could say like, well, in this context, what, if, what does truth mean? Like if, if truth is just the best way to survive if it's more of a pragmatic thing reality well, like yeah well fiat kind of was the truth because the fiat apparatus had constructed a system that made that thing an imperative and if you don't respond to the imperatives of your environment you're fucked 
And so yeah. it's like it, it just, was just try just try to live like a Bitcoiner. Right. Pre so it was the most beneficial quote unquote choice for a period of time for you know certain people to act as though that were true. You know, again, this is very interesting territory as well, because it, it, it's almost like the, the process of religion and the process of even money, perhaps, is like, what is the best thing to act as though is true? There's always like this element of faith, because we never have complete or perfect knowledge, right? So like, what should you be acting as though is true? And I think the the real, you know, in the real juicy question is, like, do you not want it to be the case that the thing that you're acting as though it's true is actually the thing that has the best claim on truth or is the closest mm -hmm. approximation of some grander truth? And I would probably say the answer is yes. But to your example here, there's a lot of nuance in between because, you know, the grander metaphysical truth doesn't matter if they're going to throw you in jail for not paying your taxes with fiat, right? So there's a, there's a profound pragmatic element to how you maneuver the world and what you can because, is truth to do so because in the in the in the in the in the perspective of whoever tr tr uh, throws you in jail you're breaking their truth because you're right. saying I, I don't want to pay this because i'm not you're not entitled to steal from me and they say wait no we are entitled to steal from you and you have now we have to put you in jail because we cannot have people not wanting to be steal steal from right. stolen from running around Totally. And one, so, of, one, of, one of the ways you, we were talking about this conceptualizing of freedom with all everything concentrating to the head and, and being shackled and everything concentrating down. I mean, maybe another one of the ways to conceptualize truth is the thing that most grants liberation, the thing that most grants freedom. I mean, Bitcoin's a great example, right? I mean, in many ways, you could, you could describe it as like an immutable ledger, like a thing that can't lie to itself, a thing that can only propagate truth. And what is the impact or the result of that? Well, the result is that people are are feeling a sense of liberation all over the world in a very similar way. And there you are trying to uh, conceptualize or showcase that or represent that in, in an artistic or creative fashion. And so maybe, you know, truth is the thing which most liberates. And we have the quote, yeah. the truth shall set you free, right? This is a, you know, a famous uh, theological or religious uh, quote. I can't remember who said it. it Might have been. Might have been Christ, but don't quote me on that. Um, mm -hmm. But so maybe that's how we construe and conceptualize truth. It's like the thing that most permits you to engage in your own agency, most permits you to move through the, the matrix of the environment that is before you without impediment or minimizing impediment. Yeah, and, and you juxtapose that to the fiat system, which is, I don't even know if, I don't, I don't want to like, just compare truth and lies but there is definitely a promise always the 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 in fiat there is always a promise you're promising to pay something back mm. or to mm -hmm. go and collect something there's that promise both sides agree on if you're if you're if you're if i borrow money from you i'm promising you to pay you back but you're also promising there's going to be consequences if you don't pay me back because if there's no promise then why am i paying you back and as as we're all fallible and the world corrupts after we engage on that bond, uh, then we have to start lying to each other. <laughs> you have to right, try, right. pretend that you're stronger than you are. So I feel afraid to pay. I need to come up with excuses uh, not to pay. And it just ev devolves from that uh, until you get to kind of the world we are now and we're about to go to. But if you have Bitcoin, it just turns everything. Now you don't need to trust anybody. So you have to, you have an incentive to act honestly because pretty much the reputation is is much more volatile. Uh, like you, with fiat, you can always borrow more money to to buy yourself credentials or uh, lend more money to shut shut someone up. Mm -hmm. But in Bitcoin, because it's finite and it's it's verifiable on both ends and everybody knows who owns what, now you're free to just act normal. Yeah. You don't need totally. to always be deceiving. You don't need to always be threatening. You can just collaborate and cooperate. Another example of the truth setting you free, right? The truth liberating you. You're not passing around these debt obligations where, as you say, it causes this 
perversion in behavior, or at least it incentivizes a perversion in behavior. And then that, you know, given a sufficient time, that wound, winds up in a hell of a lot of problems, many of which we could identify in the world today. And so what happens when you invert that, when you're the, the thing you're using to trade or to trade it does not come with an obligation, does not come with disinformation or untruth or lies or corruption in that mechanism? What happens when it's just pure truth? What, what behaviors does that incentivize? And how much does that, instead of shackling people, free them up? Well, this is why we Bitcoin, right? This is why we're so enthusiastic about this thing, because, you know, those questions are so compelling and the answers to them are so motivating and hopeful that we can't help but be devoted singularly to this thing, it seems. No, um, all right, I'll let you go. But the, before I do, um, you're you involved in a couple other projects, at least I can tell from your Twitter handle. One seems like you released a book a couple of years ago. Um, Tell me briefly uh, about that. And then also, are you working on a, a Bitcoin wallet or something? A SAT card or SAT? SAT signer, yes. SAT signer. Uh, Do you so want to this... shill those two things before we shut it down? I have this book. It's the um, it's the printed code of the, the first version of the Bitcoin protocol to be released. Cool. And this is where I kind of like, where I draw the inspiration for the film. And um, probably not I, the most I, compelling reading, but interesting to have. Well, it is, it is, it is. If you're, if you know what you're looking at, it is actually really interesting to actually discover. Once you get more familiar with the protocol, now you can open the book and look at any line and understand what part of the protocol it's affecting. Mm. And if, if you then take some time to learn the basics of C plus plus, the all the all the all the variables are written in in kind of plain english there's some little comments that satoshi left that's just code that doesn't execute or just code that's not code and um and the, it's logical and it works so if satoshi can do it you can do it not make it but understand it and there's also another version that i'm working on that's going to take for each spread there's going to be code and then it's going to be explanation, so call outs to the code, so you can know exactly which line is doing what, because cool. every single line there makes something important. Cool. And tell me about the set signer. So the set signer is a is a wallet that I'm trying to kind of jumpstart with some other Bitcoiners. We already have some people working on it, but again. It just needs more money to pay the developers because I don't know how to develop an app like that. I just designed the experience, but I'm always listening to podcasts and taking notes of how when people complain about something that they're missing in an app. And I just, at some point, the list got so big and I had these little patterns of UI and UX that I had saved somewhere. And I thought, okay, just if we bring these two together, we'll potentially make the perfect quote unquote bitcoin wallet for the the more hardened bitcoin bitcoiner that wants to know more about bitcoin and not just like abstract everything away so this is kind of this is more of an idea of a it's a wallet but it's also a a block explorer it's a transaction explorer it's a UTXO selection method that I don't think I've ever seen implemented anywhere that's going to potentially clarify how Bitcoin sits in your private keys with the different UTXOs, mm -hmm. how you can merge them, how you can create different types of outputs. And, um, and hopefully it's something that will teach the same way that, uh, for instance, Sparrow Wallet taught me stuff and made me understand Bitcoin in a more uh, deep, deep way. And now I can, I can act on Bitcoin with more confidence because I open Spare Wallet and I know exactly what's happening. It's not like these other apps that have just like send button and amount. And you just have to believe that when you press send, that something is going to happen. They hide all the transaction data. I, I like looking at the hex of the transaction. I like to see a, a pre-signed transaction. I know it's not for everybody, but uh, the Bitcoiners seem to be somewhat interested, at least the ones I know. 
Mm -hmm. because I also, I tend to associate with the more technical kind of geeky Bitcoin, I guess, Bitcoiner. Nice. Well, look, um, give one more shill to the film page so that anyone who's interested in checking it out, seeing examples, seeing the work thus far, maybe even contributing can do so. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed this discussion today. I appreciate you making the time and, or, and, and, you know, booking yourself in um, love the project and uh, really hope that it's not too long before it's brought to fruition. Cause uh, I really want it selfishly for myself. I really want to watch it selfishly for myself. Cool. Thanks. Uh, work in progress. Anybody that wants to, learn more you can go to anatomyofbitcoin.com there's a, an open telegram group you can follow on Nosser. you can also follow on twitter um yeah and just look around uh, if you if you see something that feels wrong let me know and we can work together at fixing it or you can fix it yourself and do a pull request and if you're making a if you're planning to do a film a live action film or any narrative on bitcoin consider just open sourcing everything and letting the the Bitcoiners help you build it because that's how I've been doing it. And it's been nice to see something that I can start just by myself without requiring any money and just have people contribute with their time and money and whatever they want to do. Totally. Well, look, um, you'll have to come back whenever it gets over the line to discuss, you know, the finished version um, but until then, good luck on all the work. I know there's a lot of work in front of you and I hope, uh, I hope some others join in to help out and, uh, yeah, thanks again. We'll, we'll talk again in the future. Yeah. Thanks for giving me the, the platform to talk about it. My pleasure. See you brother. See you.